The monk is a weird class. Most people don't stop to think about it because the monk is such an ingrained part of D&D and RPGs in general, but it is still a weird class. Lore-wise, it's the most obvious exception to D&D's European fantasy style. Mechanics-wise, the class is made up of unrelated features that often don't tie into each other or the system they're a part of. And despite the class's long and impressive looking list of features, the monk spent most of its history just flat out sucking. The class is doing a lot better in the present day, but it took decades to get here. So in this video, we'll trace the martial artist's journey back through the different editions and learn why it was often called the worst class in D&D. <laughs> Welcome to DM It All, a show where we talk about Dungeons & Dragons books and tabletop gaming history. So far, we've only done module walkthroughs, but we want to take a stab at something different this time around. We're not focusing on one book or even one edition of D&D. Instead, we're going to analyze a concept as it progressed and evolved through various decades and rule sets. The Monk was kind of a natural choice for this style of video, since it has largely remained the same, while also taking on some weird tangents. It also touches on an idea that is very key to D&D as a whole. Of course, there definitely are classes that are worse than the monk, but they're usually more niche and specific to certain editions. Classes like the beggar, or the <clears throat> pest controller, which yes, are real classes from old school D&D books, are deserving of more ire. The monk, however, was often a bad core class. And even when it wasn't always a core class, it was iconic enough to make an appearance in every edition. Not only was the class usually terrible, but it managed to be abysmal in so many different editions for so many years. To talk about the monk and how weird it is, we should first talk about what the class was trying to emulate. The origins of the class aren't explained in the earliest D&D books, so many players from back then literally pictured a monk as a badass Franciscan friar. Of course, most people now know that the class is based on Eastern mythology instead of Western mythology, or more accurately, a Western pop culture take on Eastern mythology. The monk was created during Dave Arneson's Blackmore playtests, sometime between 1970 and 1975. Blackmore was the very first D&D campaign setting ever made, and multiple monks appeared in these playtests. But the class that later debuted in the actual Blackmore supplement book was created by Brian Bloom, one of the partners at TSR, TSR being the original publisher of D&D for those that don't know. There are many conflicting stories as to who came up with the monk first and why, but the most likely story seems to be the one from Tim Cask, the editor of the Blackmore book. According to Cask, Bloom was inspired by the Blackmore playtests and eventually went on to create the fully detailed class as we know it today. Gary Gygax claimed that the class was created because of Bloom's love for the series of martial arts novels called The Destroyer. Tim Cask, however, claimed that Bloom was actually inspired by the TV show Kung Fu. Blackmore playtester Mike Mornard claimed game designer Jim Ward created the class and he did it out of his love for the song Kung Fu Fighting. Frankly, these all probably played a role in the class's creation, as it's hard to trace every iconic monk feature to just one source. Bruce Lee's films had started to come out in America around this time, and they created a sort of kung fu craze. It's where the song Kung Fu Fighting and the Kung Fu TV show that Cask cited came from. Bruce Lee was planning to star in the Kung Fu TV show before his untimely death in 1973, so the program instead ended up starring David Carradine as the main character, a white man raised by a Shaolin monastery. The fact that this show starred a Shaolin monk is probably why the D&D class is even called what it is. Spoilers, most Eastern Buddhist monks don't perform Kung Fu. The Shaolin Monastery was a very specific Buddhist temple that performed its own martial arts style called Wushu. The show, Kung Fu, could have also inspired the original fish-out-of-water nature of the D&D class too. A Shaolin monk in the Wild West is almost as weird as one appearing in a European fantasy setting. The long-running Destroyer series of novels was created before the Kung Fu craze, but it became big around the same time. These books focused on an assassin named Remo Williams, who worked for a secret government organization working outside the law. 
Rimo's trainer was Chun, the stereotypical strict and mocking martial arts mentor. Chun was the last master of a fictional martial art called Sinanju, so this was more or less American kung fu fan fiction. The fact this influenced the monk class shows that the monk wasn't really born out of a devotion to Eastern culture or its teachings. The monk was created because some people thought that kung fu was cool. D&D's creators were pretty big history nerds, but the monk was more of a display of their fanboy nerd side. The monk that was released in the 1975 Blackmore supplement came right out of the gate with many of the class's iconic features. 1. Scaling Unarmed Damage The martial artists generally did the most absurd damage out of anybody at high levels. The original versions of this class could actually equip any weapon in the game, but despite that, their crushing unarmed strikes were the better choice. 2. No armor allowed. Instead, the martial artists got a scaling armor class bonus that went up as they leveled. 3. Flurry of Blows. The martial artists could perform more attacks than any other class when unarmed. 4. Improved Movement Speed. The martial artists had access to a scaling movement speed, which usually made them the fastest class. 5. Slow Fall. Martial artists could slow their descent when near a wall, reducing their falling damage. They could fall greater heights as they leveled up. 6. Improve Mental Defenses Martial artists were usually harder to hit with mind-affecting abilities. 7. Improved Physical Defenses Martial artists took no damage on successful saving throws and took only half damage on failed saving throws. Later additions granted them immunity to certain physical conditions as well. 8. Stunning Fists Later additions turned this into a limited resource, but early monks could stun opponents all day if they beat an opponent's armor class by 5. They even had a chance of outright killing an opponent. The downside is that the class used the thief attack table instead of the superior fighter table, so they had trouble just hitting their opponents, much less stunning them. 9. Quivering Palm This was basically the 5-point palm exploding heart technique from Kill Bill. The idea of a touch of death was popular around the time, to the point that some unverified writers claimed that it was what caused Bruce Lee's death. Early monks could only use this ability once a week, and yes, once a week abilities were a thing back then. 10. A bunch of other stuff. Martial artists could block arrows midair, self-heal a negligible amount, feign death, and talk to plants or animals. As you can see, this list is kind of a mess, and it made the class one of the most complicated to play. As you look at this list, keep in mind the fighter's main features were having the best equipment and the best attack table. The thief's main feature was just access to thief skills, which the monk also got on top of everything else. Really, if the monk had any role, it was as a replacement for the thief. Early versions of this class were usually labeled as a cleric subclass for whatever reason, but it was actually a weird thief subclass in disguise. The original monk surprisingly had better skills than the thief class, but the thief leveled way faster, could backstab opponents, and didn't suffer the monk's huge limitations, of which we'll now get into. First of all, there were character creation requirements to even qualify for the monk class. Stats were rolled randomly back then, and the scores you rolled determined which classes were available to you. Thieves didn't really have any requirements, but monks needed great wisdom, good strength, and good dexterity. Keep in mind that players back then had to roll 3d6 for stat generation, and couldn't choose which number totals got assigned where, so good luck getting a 15 or even a 12. Another major weakness was that monks followed the paladin code of honor regarding their gear, which meant they had to give up most of their plunder to the poor. They also couldn't hire any mercenaries either. While these restrictions made them arguably less fun to play, their biggest issue was their low health. Monks rolled d4s for hit dice, which made them as frail as the magic users. Magic users actually had a lot in common with the monk, since they were both unable to wear armor and were entirely dependent on the party for protection. Except, you know, magic users don't have to be frontline fighters. Monks and magic users both leveled up slowly, but even the magic user had an easier time leveling than the monk. In all the early versions of D&D, there could only be a certain number of high-level martial artists in the world. A monk looking to level up would have to find, and best, one of the existing masters to take their place. This was cool in terms of class flavor, but losing the challenge meant the character effectively went down a full level. The monk also had to keep fighting different masters to keep making progress. 
high-level masters did so much damage and were so hard to hit that these fights weren't even interesting to watch. It was basically about who got luckier with their roles. The monk's damage and armor class at high levels were the upsides of the class, since they made the monk broken in a useful way instead of the bad way. Thankfully, the advanced edition was only a few years away from the Blackmore supplement, except AD&D's take on the monk managed to be even worse. The Monk was included in the AD&D Player's Handbook, making it a core class for the first time. It appears Inertia has carried the Monk for most of its existence, since it's only remained a core class because of its prominence in AD&D. And it was probably only a core class in AD&D, because every class from the original game was a core class in AD&D. The AD&D Monk was listed out of alphabetical and logical order to be the fifth archetype listed, which is pretty appropriate because it's the fifth wheel in any party. Author and D&D co-creator Gary Gygax said the reason the class shows up where it does is because it might be the deadliest one. So he was basically claiming to save the best for last, which is kind of cute. The class didn't change that much from the original D&D, but the game changed around it. In original D&D, only fighters could benefit from a high strength or dexterity score. Now every class got attack and evasion bonuses from those stats except for the monk. Understandably, this didn't help the class that was already having trouble hitting things and taking a hit at early levels. To add insult to injury, characters needed high dexterity and strength to even qualify for the class, so any player who rolled high on character creation could choose to give up their great stat advantages to play a monk, or they could keep their stats and just play a beefy fighter. Even the monk's assortment of small features became quickly outclassed. The Slowfall ability at higher levels could be matched by the magic user's Featherfall spell, a spell, mind you, the magic user could get at first level. The Stunning Fist ability also became worse, both because of the worse attack chances and also because it affected less creatures. On the bright side, this was the first version of the monk to gain an immunity to diseases and poison. And remember, poisons were insta-death back then. In case you think it's just our opinion that the AD&D monk sucked, TSR essentially admitted it themselves a few years later. TSR released an article called, Why Isn't This Monk Smiling?, in issue 53 of Dragon, their official magazine. The article was written by Philip Myers, and it basically listed the issues we already mentioned while proposing some fixes. Myers gave the class more health, better stat growth, and an easier leveling progression. He also redefined the class more as a fighter than a thief, taking away access to certain skills like lockpicking in the process. Skills which really shouldn't have been monk abilities in the first place, especially since D&D monks were supposed to be lawful. Myers' article seems to be the first appearance of monk fists being treated as magical weapons for the purpose of hitting difficult enemies. Before this, many enemies, like ghosts, couldn't be hurt by naked fists. This, however, created another long-enduring problem, since magical fists still greatly lagged behind the magic weapons everyone else inevitably acquired. Even the writer of this fix admits that the monk won't be karate chopping through iron golems anytime soon. This touches on one of the fundamental problems with the class, and why it got its ass kicked by ghosts and golems in the first place. The monk and a lot of the early classes didn't often have full agreement on the level of fantasy versus grit. Gary Gygax claimed in the AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide that monks are not supermen, despite the fact that high-level fighters in original D&D were literally called superheroes. But I guess that's what the monk gets for being a weird thief cleric thing instead of a fighter. The Myers redesign argues that pure physical strength alone doesn't account for everything a monk can accomplish. So Myers established the class as more supernatural and gave it psionic abilities. Psionic abilities in AD&D basically amounted to another magic system based on mental telepathic power. It was also crazy complicated and involved lots of weird calculations, but Myers ignored the actual psionic mechanics for this article. Instead, he allowed the monk to cast specific psionic abilities once per day as if they were regular old spells. A lot of these were minor powers such as reduced aging, extreme empathy, object manipulation, and extreme equilibrium. Yes, instead of being able to explode head scanner style, the monk could instead mentally adjust the weight of his body. 
What these abilities did was play up the wise sage angle, and gave characters more options to interact with the story. There were also a few more flashy abilities too, such as invisibility and teleportation. Again, only once per day though. Overall, these features did make the class significantly stronger, but this fix was still too messy and overly complicated. Some features were even redundant, like Dimension Walk, Plane Shift, and Astral Projection all being separate abilities that allowed the monk to travel to another plane of reality. These abilities all operate differently too, to make things extra annoying to remember. But overall, this article was a step in the right direction, and it influenced many of the monks to follow. The final monk revision for AD&D came in the Oriental Adventures book. This revision wasn't really a fix as much as it was TSR putting the class in its proper Eastern context. This is the first time that Ki, aka spiritual energy, was mentioned as the source of their powers. Additionally, the class got some buffs in this book by being given access to the martial arts system. This system granted characters specific stat boosts, and a larger number of attacks depending on the fighting style being used. Styles also granted access to special abilities that were basically precursors to feats from later editions. Except that these abilities were achieved through story progression instead of regular old leveling. The fact that it took this long for a system like martial arts to be introduced shows why the monk was a weird fit for D&D in the first place. The class as a concept is very maneuverability based, but D&D didn't really have maneuvers for the longest time, and when they did, they wound up being pretty complicated extra systems tacked onto regular rules. D&D was generally not a system focused around complex melee combat, which was unfortunately a necessity for a class based on martial arts. Ironically, after finally giving the proper eastern context to the monk, TSR removed it from the core rules in the second edition. Gary Gygax wasn't involved in second edition, but he seemed to regret the class being shoehorned into the default European setting of D&D. Maybe the intention of most people at TSR was to make the monk more of a setting-specific class, like the samurai or the ninja. Or maybe, just maybe, they realized the class was terrible. Whatever the reason was, TSR added a monk-like class in the priest's handbook a year later. It was now a cleric subclass rather than a full class. And remember, it was labeled the cleric subclass in earlier editions, but now it was actually based on the cleric instead of being a pseudo-thief. These subclasses were called kits, and they were kind of like the archetypes in modern D&D that add different flavors for the main classes. The Fighting Monk, as it was called, was a step down from a regular cleric. It sacrificed access to spell variety, armor, worldly fortune, and the ability to turn undead in order to get some monk features, like reduced falling damage and improved unarmed attacks. These features were replicated by giving the class second edition proficiencies instead of tacking on scaling tables like in the past. This meant that the class was only somewhat better at unarmed fighting and never grew into the devastating fist damage abomination from earlier editions. They even left out any scaling armor bonus whatsoever, meaning the unarmored brawler would remain forever easy to hit. This particular version doesn't get an exception to the second edition unarmed fighting rules either which means armed opponents always beat the monk's initiative and get plus four to attack and to damage. The terrible fighting monk led to a somewhat improved version in the Forgotten Realms book called Face and Avatars six years later, Forgotten Realms being the most famous D&D setting and the default one for 5th edition. This class wasn't setting specific for long either, as it was later added to the Spells and Magic Player option book a year later. For whatever reason, this revision required high intelligence instead of high dexterity and strength. That makes this version the first monk to need almost every stat to be good, since frontline fighters still require decent physical stats. This class did get the scaling armor and class bonus of the original monk, but only if the character was not the victim of an unseen attack. Kind of makes it appropriate that the monk's worst enemy would become the backstabbing thief. Ironically, this revision didn't get any thief abilities at all, even though the class's role was supposed to be the jack-of-all-trades of the party, somewhat like the bard. This revision also lacked the absurd number of attacks and the insane damage of past monks. The biggest advantage to the cleric monks from this edition are the knockout and wrestling rules. These rules generally benefited only the monk, since wrestling had huge armor penalties, and only the updated monk got to bypass the unarmed fighting penalties. The knockout rules were similar to the old Stunning Fist rules, except monks could boost their chances for stunning, especially with martial arts. Wrestling basically gave characters a chance to grab enemies in a specific hold, depending on their role. 
These unarmed rules allowed monks to stop opponents in their tracks, or potentially take them out with a single hit. The downside was that the monk was still a glass cannon and could be taken out very easily. The only appearance of the classic monk in 2nd edition AD&D is in the Scarlet Brotherhood supplement from 1999. The Scarlet Brotherhood was Gygax's attempt to justify the class in his more western Greyhawk setting. This one is worth noting because it was the first version of the class to be made by D&D's current publisher, Wizards of the Coast. The biggest change to the overall class history is that Stunning Fist was now a declared ability, usable a certain number of times per day. This Stunning Fist is similar to the new standard for 3rd edition, but this version had a chance to auto-kill stunned opponents. These monks also had the d8 die for health, and could actually use their strength and dexterity bonuses too. Unfortunately, the Scarlet Brotherhood is an organization of mm, evil fantasy Nazis, so there's some baggage there. In a way, it does explain why this version is stupidly strong, however, since it was probably meant for a boss NPCs. To backtrack slightly, there's also the Basic Edition of D&D to cover. Basic was the simpler alternative at the time to advance Dungeons & Dragons, so it had way less options. It originally had seven classes, and three of them were Elf, Halfling, and Dwarf. Yes, Basic had classes and races mean the same thing. But they did eventually introduce a class called the Mystic that was the monk in everything but name. It was initially a monster for the dungeon master to make NPCs with, but it became an optional player class in the 1991 Rules Cyclopedia. The optional qualifier was probably because it was a monk, so the balance was questionable. The Mystic largely resembled the classic monk, minus the stunning fists, though it did set some new trends for the 3rd edition to follow. Mystics were the first take on the classic monk that didn't have to duel kung fu masters for leveling purposes. They were also the first that didn't need to live a life of poverty, though their monk cloister could take what they wanted from them. Quivering Palm was now usable once per day instead of once per week, though here it was a unique version called the Gentle Touch. The Gentle Touch could still kill people, but the character could also choose to charm, command, hold, or fully cure a person instead. It was a nice way to give options to players who didn't want their monk to explode people's hearts all of the time. With 3rd edition, the monk was finally back to being a core class again, incorporated more fully than he ever was before. Lore-wise, monk temples were now scattered across the land, and monks were no longer outsiders by default. Mechanics-wise, stat requirements for classes were no longer a thing, so people could actually play the class now. 3rd edition had the biggest rules change up until that point, but the system tried to be faithful to the spirit of classic AD&D, which is probably why the monk came back in full force, even if it still sucked. In fact, this is the second biggest example after the AD&D monk of the class being atrocious. The AD&D version is worse overall, but at least it dealt ridiculous damage later on. 3rd edition monks, however, only got worse as they progressed. There were several reasons for this, and it relates to why 3rd edition fighting types in general got worse as they leveled. Extra attacks previously functioned in weird ways, so 3rd edition tried to clean them up by making them only available if a character didn't move during that turn. But that meant that players that moved around a lot would be severely penalized in damage output, especially if they had a lot of attacks. The monk in particular is famous for having a lot of attacks and for having a high movement speed. In 3rd edition, the class was enabled to use these two features together. This is a prime example of how the class's features are more of a checklist than guiding principles. Often there is a greater focus on fitting everything from the classic monk into the newer editions, instead of making sure that the features make sense within the new rule set. Third edition also had a huge disparity between magic users and non-magic users in general. Casters simply had more options available to them via their spells, and they could usually outfight the fighting types on top of the usual wizard stuff they did. Previous editions needed fighters to protect the super fragile casters in the early levels, but 3rd edition reduced the length of time and the degree that was true by a huge amount. According to fans, most of the core fighting classes were tier 4 or 5, which meant they were only good at one thing, and tier 5s weren't even able to do that one thing very well. Fighters, for example, didn't have any class features, so any other class could match what they do and then some. 
Paladins had class features, but they were mostly flavorful, like detect evil at will and remove disease once a week. And both of these classes barely got any skills, so they were practically useless outside of combat. Wizards, clerics, and druids were tier 1, which meant they could be good at everything. Tier 3 was the sweet spot for having useful classes with actual limitations, but it took a while for the game to make classes more in this vein. Class balance, as a concept, didn't even really exist in D&D until 3rd edition changed it into a more standardized miniatures wargame. And if fighting types in 3E was bad, the monk may have been the worst of the core fighting types. The class finally lost its prerequisite stat scores, but 3rd edition was unique in that every class made use of all of its stats. The monk in particular needed every stat to be high, since many class features were calculated based on wisdom. They even needed high intelligence to determine the number of available skills they had. And yes, this addition put the class back into the off-brand thief role, so utilizing those skills was the ideal way to play. The monk even had the same weak attack bonus as the thief, aka the rogue. Except now attack bonuses also affected combat maneuvers like wrestling, aka grappling, maneuvers that you know, the monk used to excel at. The biggest upside to this version, at least flavor-wise, was the continuation of the psionic monk concept. Now the class evolved into an ageless, otherworldly entity by max level. Mechanics-wise, the bonuses from this idea were super limited though, since there are easier ways to gain access to a once-per-day teleport. Power levels were increased across the board with this addition, so once again, the monk's features got outclassed. There still exist proper ways to build a monk thanks to all the crazy splat books available, but it generally involves multi-classing. You'd be better off playing a spellcaster or the sword sage if you wanted to punch stuff. The sword sage was basically a more magical and over-the-top fighting class, and it was a prototype for the game changes to come. Fourth edition became a different beast from the other editions, mostly because of the dominance of spellcasting in the third edition. Now every class had spells all of the time. Or at least they functioned similarly to spells, even though they were now called powers. Each class had a selection of at-will and per-encounter powers on top of the usual once-per-day powers. The idea was to give everyone a wide range of abilities tied to a resource system because the mage's flexibility is what made them so mighty. Third edition monks could become broken if they focused on grappling or tripping, but if the party met opponents that were immune to those effects, like, say, a flying dragon, the monk would be screwed. Having options for a variety of scenarios was usually what made classes good, and this was the spellcaster's forte. Because of the power system, 4th edition wasn't even capable of having a class be as bad as the earlier monks. But the monk was actually left out of the original 4th edition books, demoted from core class status after regaining it in 3rd edition. This was probably, at least partially, due to the fact that the monk, being a core class, never did it any favors. It's an oddity that's tough to balance by itself, much less when coupled with a whole new rule set at the same time. The class wasn't added until Player's Handbook 3, which was two years into the edition's lifespan. This handbook released the new psionic rules, and they were significantly less weird than they were in the past. But that doesn't matter for this video, because the monk doesn't even use them even though it was still considered a psionic class. Because it wouldn't be the monk without some weirdness. Even though the class didn't use psionics, 4E monks were the most fantastical monks to ever be designed. They're more akin to something out of Street Fighter than Enter the Dragon. And they could take different paragon paths to become even more fantastical, making this the first monk to provide different options for progressing. There were some new ideas unique to just this version of the class, like being able to use movement options and attack options in the same turn. This made them the most mobile class, but also one of the most complicated classes mechanically, in an addition that was already very complicated due to the variety of options and interactions. This version was also unique in that it used a key focus item to determine attack bonuses and abilities, instead of what weapon was being used. A lot of the class's previous abilities, like Quivering Palm, became powers instead, which resulted as a net positive. For the once per day abilities, it tied them to a unified mechanic, instead of having them operate with their own weird, individual, and specific rules. Even attaching passive monk abilities to a resource system improved the class overall. Features tied to a resource system are usually budgeted more generously than always-on abilities, 
Magic users had the most options available to them out of every class, but because their spells had limited uses, they usually weren't considered broken by casual observers. There's a natural cap to the spellcasting mechanic, so it seems more balanced, even if it often wasn't. So, the 4th edition version of the class was pretty good, but 4th edition as a whole was an oddity in D&D history. It didn't play like any other D&D edition, and the classes were radically changed to suit the new direction. 5th edition was the real moment of truth for the Wizards of the Coast, to see if they could actually make a well-designed version of the classic monk. But before we get to 5th edition, we should briefly mention Pathfinder and its version of the class. Pathfinder was another company's attempt to continue from 3rd edition while sticking closer to that rule set. Because of that, the Pathfinder monks still had a lot of the same fundamental issues as the 3e version, and it remained one of the weakest classes until Pathfinder Unchained years later. We mainly bring it up because it introduced the Key Pool, a resource system to power monk abilities. At first, spending key points lets the class run even faster, do even more attacks, and be even more evasive. But at higher levels, the key pool also powered more uses of other monk abilities, like the self-heal and teleportation. 5th edition took the key pool idea and integrated it to a greater degree within the class. Flurry of Blows and Stunning Strike in particular are now powered exclusively by key points, instead of being completely unrelated features as they were in 3e. As the class leveled, it could also choose between different archetypes to expand its key powers and its options. This is like the 4e Paragon Paths in that it provided a multitude of leveling customization, but it also helped the classic monk become less bogged down with features. The classic options like Quivering Palm were available in one archetype, while old psionic abilities like Teleportation were available in the Shadow archetype. There's also an Elemental Monk more in the style of 4th edition, though it's the worst of the archetypes available. The 5e monk is on a much lower power level than the 4e take, but it's still a massive step up from the monks of old. The key pool is an interesting way to give the monk a resource system that's unique to the class. The class also now comes out of the gate as an amazing damage dealer instead of being trash at the start and then broken later on. It's a solid class overall, which is even more impressive when you think about how much of a mess the monk was for most of its existence. <laughs> The monk was always a class defined by its details rather than a clear vision. From the moment of its conception, it had a long list of unrelated features that almost every version afterwards felt obligated to include, even if the features made no sense. It took until the 4th and 5th edition for these details to finally unite under a main mechanic. The staggering amount of features also made the class more of a trap for new players. Anyone who saw the walls of text and extra tables probably figured that this class must be awesome if it has so many abilities. We don't know what kind of conclusion to draw from this, except know a class's purpose before you make it. More features don't always make a class better, especially if those features hog up space that could be going towards a more united class role. Like we mentioned, the early fighter could only, well, fight well, but they were a better choice than the monk since they reliably fought well. Monks could take the place of thieves, but people didn't see it as a thief class because of all of its fighting features. With the thief, you know your role, and you generally don't get killed trying to be a frontline fighter. Giving players more tools begs the player to try them out, so those tools better make sense for the class. But while the monk doesn't historically reflect a good design, it does reflect a uniquely Dungeons and Dragons design. It's basically a homebrew class. You know, the kind that people make for fun to play the characters they love. Players in the Blackmoor playtest loved kung fu movies, and they wanted to play kung fu masters in their little game of wish fulfillment. It's like if D&D was made now, and Dragoons or the Jedi were made into a core class. The monk even fits the style of homebrew design, as the list of features are probably stuff the fans saw in a kung fu film at one point or another. And like most homebrew classes, it was just a list of features. There wasn't enough thought put into what this class added as an archetype that the other classes did not. The monk even managed to represent both homebrew classes that are broken strong and those that are broken weak, since it starts as the latter and transforms into the former. The monk was added before anyone knew any better, before anyone knew if this Dungeons and Dragons thing would really take off. 
Many of the people working on the original game didn't even seem to like the classic monk, but they were willing to play along with their kung fu hungry friends. No one cared if the class dealt absurd damage or was super awkward to play because no one knew if anyone would even play the damn game in the first place. And like a lot of D&D elements, the class became too iconic to change after the game became a hit. So instead we got minor tweaks along the way and a lot, and I mean a lot, of bad monks. But we also got one of our most iconic staples in role-playing games. We all have probably played or tried out a monk class in one game or another and we all likely have fond memories of it. Honestly, the only reason the monk even exists at all in those games is because it was first in D&D. So even if it's a weird thing in retrospect, we all have a relationship with it now. It has a legacy no amount of game analysis can really touch. Even if nothing about the class makes sense, the guiding spirit behind it always will. And that guiding spirit is that Kung Fu is cool. And using Kung Fu to punch monsters in the face is even cooler. There's just something satisfying about saying screw the weapon, screw the armor, all I need are my fists. And we have the monk to thank for popularizing that sentiment in RPGs nowadays. Thank you for listening to DM It All. This was our first stab at analysis and seeing the development of an idea throughout different editions. Our next video will probably be another module walkthrough, but we'll be trying out new formats as we go along. So let us know what you think, and if you'd like to see any more videos in this vein. Also, feel free to suggest any other D&D oddities you would like to know more about. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you all next session.